Are we on? Is it roughly two o'clock on a Tuesday? Uh, hi everyone, it's the Wrong Kids Show. Uh, lovely to have you here. It's a very snowy day in Toronto. Uh, hoping we can all hang out together uh, for a little bit um, until for like the next half hour. For those of you who are brand new, uh, this is a children's Instagram show to help with distance learning. Uh, so if you are in your uh, kitchen right now, watching or in your living room, hello, hello. If you're a regular, drop your name in the chat. Uh, we'd love to see you here today. If you're in a classroom, uh, hello as well, whether you are virtual or are in person. Uh, it is lovely to welcome you here today too. Uh, if you're a regular, drop your name in that chat. We want to know who's hanging out with us today. Uh, we have a very special episode uh, we're very lucky to have with us paleontologist Jade Simon uh, on today to talk about some really important subjects. Uh, we're going to talk about disability, we're going to talk about service dogs, and of course we're going to talk about our favorite theme on this show, dinosaurs. It's very, very cool and good to have you today to talk about these subjects. Um, our episodes also go up on YouTube uh, later in the week. So you can catch last week's episode uh, with Mark Peck, where we talked all about winter birds um, and we made a bird feeder. Uh, that one's up on YouTube right now. And next Tuesday at 2 p.m. right here, uh, we have Dr. Kim Tate on to talk about all of the amazing things that are happening on Mars right now. Because you will never believe just how many rovers and missions are currently heading to the red planet as we speak. I'm feeling about ready to do the theme song and then we're gonna get uh, get started on our art and then meet paleontologist Jade Simon. Oh no, I wonder if I put it out of tune. And we'll find out. Welcome to the Rom Kid Show with me. We'll do some crafts and tell some stories. Let's talk about science, art, and history. Welcome to the Wrong Kid Show, starring you and me. We found our way through the theme song portion of the event right there. Let's head over to our art table to get ready with all the materials we need. Woo! I'm wearing my Zool socks today because obviously dinosaur themed episode. Um, okay. So today we are doing some invisible art and you'll find out how uh, invisible art matches our theme of disability dogs and dinosaurs as we make our way through a hint it has to do with representation. So we'll deal with that in a little bit. So what do you need? You need some paper, all right? You need a white crayon because um, uh, the wax of the white crayon plays a really key role in this and then you need some watercolor paint, all right? And then you can, the watercolor paint choice is all up to you, whatever you would like, okay? So grab all those things. If you have questions um, today, uh, we're gonna talk about service dogs and all sorts of things, feel free to put them into the chat. Um, we also have, um, we're gonna talk about dinosaurs too. So if you would like to talk about dinosaurs, put your questions in the chat. We will deal with your dinosaur questions at the very end. And I'm gonna move my glass of water, oh, right here, to over here. There we go, I got there in the end. It is now time to welcome our very special guest. So cool to have her here today. Just gonna open up that screen. Hello, paleontologist Jade Simon, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. This is so cool to have you on today. Uh, also with our good friend Basil there as well too. So first episode ever with two special guests on at the same time. Let's do um, our uh, first step of our project, okay? And then uh, we're gonna talk to, to Jade Simon. So uh, what we're doing for our invisible art is you're gonna use your white crayon to draw whatever you would like. I will be drawing a dinosaur today, it's somewhat dinosaur themed, plus I love dinosaurs. Draw whatever you want, um, and then later on, you'll see that it's like kind of invisible, right? Because you can't really see white crayon on white piece of paper. Um, but we'll find out later on when we put our watercolor paint over top, what 
what really happens, what appears. Um, but right now, let's start with our interview with um, Jade. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, come on with Basil. Oh, this is so exciting for us. Um, my first question, because we have Basil right here, is what what is a service dog? Like, what does Basil do? That's a great question. So service dogs are a very special type of working dog. So they train for two years or more, and they specifically train to help a person with disabilities. So a disabled person could have a service dog for a lot of different reasons. There are service dogs that help to guide the blind. There are hearing dogs that alert um, people to sounds that they need to know about um, if they are hard of hearing or deaf. There are medical alert dogs that alert to changes in your body chemistry, like seizure alert dogs and heart rate alert dogs. There's a lot of different kinds of service dogs, but the thing that makes them all service dogs is that they help disabled people with their disabilities. So Basil is a multi-purpose service dog. So she does lots of different kinds of service work. And right now she wants to play with her toy. <laughs> that makes sense. I mean, I love playing with my toys too. Okay, I have a question about Basil. Cause is Basil still in training? Yeah, Basil is just over a year old. So she's about a year and three months old. And she'll be in training until she's about two, maybe two and a half, depending on what types of tasks I end up having to have her learn. Whoa, okay, so then one of my other questions is how does someone train a service dog? That's a great question. It's complicated. There are a lot of organizations and nonprofit organizations that train service dogs for people with disabilities. And this is especially the case when we think of guide dogs. There are lots of organizations that do that and help people uh, match with guide dogs. But for chronic illnesses, like what I'm dealing with, the service dog um, concept is kind of new to that medical community. So it's only recently that we've gotten service dogs um, kind of popularly in use for chronic illnesses. So not a lot of organizations uh, have service dogs available yet. There's a lot more demand for that than there is actually like available dogs because it takes a long time to train them and a lot of resources. <laughs> she just wants pets. Um, so you can actually, if you know how to train dogs really well and you have lots of experience with it, you can work with specific service dog trainers to help you train a service dog if you're someone like me with complex chronic illnesses where I don't need a guide dog or a hearing dog, but I do need a medical alert dog. Huh. Okay. Wow. So Basil does a lot of different things and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But one of the things that I was wondering if you could help me understand is I've heard that there are lots of different types of, of dogs that help people. And so, you know, today we're talking about service dogs, but I also know the word therapy dogs, and I also know the words emotional support dogs. So are they different? Yeah, they're all really important, but there are big differences. So of those three, service dogs have the most specialized training, and they're the only one of the three that has public access rights and only works for one person. So a service dog is trained to work for one disabled handler, and they are given public access rights. They can go pretty much everywhere with their handler because they have so many years of um, intensive training to be able to be in hospitals and other settings. Um, therapy dogs are really cool. They often also have a lot of training, but they work for groups of people. A therapy dog might be the kind of dog that someone would train as, and it's their pet dog, but they train it as a therapy dog and bring it to the hospital to cheer up patients. And so the dog is really well mannered. It can go in public access if it's invited by an organization like a hospital. Um, and they go both basically to comfort people and cheer them up, but not to mitigate any sort of disability. So they're really important. Emotional support dogs are pets that do have some training to help their owners with emotional distress and to provide comfort, but they don't have um, extensive training for public access, which is why they're not allowed to go out of the home. 
you can get exceptions to housing rules. Like you can get an emotional support animal, even if your apartment doesn't allow pets, they are exempt from that rule in some places, but they can't go out public. Got it. I feel like I'm learning a lot about the differences between dogs right there. Uh, for all our friends at home, right now I'm working on my invisible art. Uh, I'm using a white, uh, what is it, a crayon uh, on my white piece of paper here. I'm drawing a dinosaur, but right now it's really, really hard to see. And what we're going to do later on is we're going to use our watercolor to be able to see our art a little bit better. It's like relief work. Okay, I have another question about service dogs and like all yeah. the work that you're doing, like how do you train a service dog? That's a good question. It's really hard, <laughs> it's a lot of work. And that's why it's really great when these organizations can uh, train them because they have teams of volunteers and also their professional trainers. But it's a lot of um, pretty intensive obedience training and task training from the time that they're eight weeks old. So they're brought out into public a lot to practice um, being in crowds and being out in public and learning all their manners. And uh, it depends on the type of work they're going to do, but there's a lot of specialized training that happens after that. So they kind of move into advanced training when they're about a year old most of the time. It depends on the program. That's where Basil's at now. So she is now learning her more specific tasks, like picking things up for me or uh, sent sniffing to see if my heart rate is going too high, things like that. And I use like scent samples to train her on that. And you see that in hunting dogs too. It's a common method to teach hunting dogs to find certain things or scent detection dogs that you might see in the airport to find things that they're looking for. The same basic training just applied in a much different way. Whoa, that's so interesting that, you know, the work that a service dog does can be similar to like you know, all different other sorts of dogs uh, in the way that they do work. Um, okay, something that I know, but I'm wondering if you could explain to me a little bit more so I can understand it, is if I see a service dog in public, I shouldn't necessarily just go up and start petting them, right? Like, how should I, as someone in the public, interact with a service dog? That's a really great question. So. This is one of the big differences between therapy dogs and service dogs too. For a service dog, because they're working for one person and it's not always obvious what their job is from the outside if, if you're not the service dog's handler, um, they need to be really focused on their job. So often, Basil, when she doesn't want to play with her toy over there, she's usually looking at me a lot of the time. Even if we're just hanging out around the house, she's looking at me. And if we were out in public or walking around the galleries of the ROM, which we often do, um, it might look like she's not really doing anything, but she's actually smelling my, like, changes in the, my heart rate and other things about my body because they have really sensitive noses. Um, so this is just for an example from what I do with Basil, but it doesn't look like she's doing much, but she is monitoring me. And if she's distracted, she might miss something. So she might not realize like that my heart rate went really high or that I needed help opening a door or something like that. So if she's distracted, it can really like keep her, uh, take her attention away from her job and she could miss something. So that's why it's really important in public. If you see a working dog and it's, it's a service dog with a person, it's important to actually give them space and um, as much as possible to kind of ignore the dog, even though it's really exciting to see them because they are really amazing at what they do and they're really impressive animals and they're really cute. Um, it's important to give them space. And if you want, if the person doesn't look busy and you want to ask them about something and they seem open to that, that's great. But it's always better to talk to the person and not talk to their service animal because it can distract them a lot. Um, especially if you kind of come up quickly or if you try to pet them, it can really distract the dog from what they're doing. Yeah. That's fascinating. I'm learning so much about service dogs. Um, okay, we showed a bunch of pictures of Basil um, with you. Uh, obviously a super cute dog, uh, but most importantly, Basil is helping you. 
in yeah. helping you be able to do the things that you need to do with your work and get around and sort of do your everyday life. So one of the questions is, is um, Jade, why do you have a service dog? <laughs> That's a good question. And I get this question a lot because it's not very obvious what my disabilities are to most people. So I am a disabled scientist, I'm a disabled person, I live with um, a few chronic illnesses, but my disabilities are what some people refer to as invisible disabilities, hmm. because they're not very obvious from the outside. So I have a connective tissue disorder, and connective tissue is everywhere in your body. It makes up lots of the different structures in your body, including your ligaments and tendons, the things that hold your bones together and help them move in efficient ways. So those are kind of like rubber bands. And so when you stretch a rubber band and then let it go, it comes back to its original shape. And if you imagine that as like a tendon or a ligament with a connective tissue disorder, it's kind of like you have an old, overly used rubber band. You know, the kind where you, you pick it out of the drawer and you stretch it and like, it doesn't snap back. It's not bouncy. It either just like kind of tears or does nothing or stays really stretched out. Yeah. I just have so like some that's... rope here that I'm using to sort yeah. of, just, it just, it just, it doesn't snap. Just Yeah, it doesn't have much like spring back. Hmm. So that's how my connective tissue is. So that's part of the disorder that I have. That's so called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And so my connective tissue, it just doesn't bounce back. And what that means is that a lot of things that are um, fairly easy for most people are not very easy for me, but it's not very obvious from the outside because it's all inside my body. So walking for a long period of time can be really tiring because my tendons aren't helping my bones move around um, you know, efficiently. They're not springing back. So it takes a lot more energy. Um, opening things can be really hard. My joints kind of come out of place really easily. Um, there's a whole lot of impacts. And so I use a lot of um, mobility aids and a service dog to help mitigate all that, to help um, lessen the impact on my daily life. We're showing some videos right now of you, uh, of Basil, our good friend Basil, um, helping you with things. And that includes Open, see, I'm gonna show this one one more time because this one is really, really cool. This is opening a refrigerator and getting some water for you. Yeah, so Basil does some really important tasks whether we're at home or outside of the house. But this is one of the most important um, for me on a daily basis. She can go get my medication bag that has my different medications in it and she can go get me water from the refrigerator so if I'm feeling really bad or I have an injury or I'm just feeling really sick that day and I can't get up for some reason, she can go get me water and get me my medication so that I can take that and drink some water and try to feel better without exerting myself, which really makes things a lot easier for me. Yeah. That is fascinating. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of the other devices that you use, but we do have some questions here from our friends at home and at school. Um, one of our questions is, um, if you really need like a service dog, can you train like your pet dog to do that work? Um, usually, no, that's not a good idea. If you need a service dog, the first step is to work with your doctor to try to figure out what the best treatment plan is because a service dog doesn't actually help everybody's disability. It really depends on the person and the types of things that you need. So for some people, a service dog, even if it could help, would not be a good option because they require a lot of care mm -hmm. and a lot of training. Even if you get a fully trained service dog from a organization, you have to keep up on the training. You walk a dog several times a day. They are energetic. They need that stamina to do their job all day. But that also means you're caring for a kind of hyper dog all day. Um, and, and that can be too hard or just not what a lot of people would like to have as part of their treatment plan because it's a lot of work. Um, and it's kind of expensive. It's, it's like having a pet in some ways, but a lot more work and a lot more expensive. <laughs> yeah. Now, 
Basil helps you get things, uh, mm -hmm. open doors, get your medication, all really, really important things for you to do um, your, your, just like your everyday life. Um, but basil can also do something for you when it comes to like your heart, right? Yeah. What's that and how does is... that work? So my heart rate can go really high, kind of out of nowhere. So if you imagine like you're running around a track or you're doing jumping jacks and you know that feeling where your heart starts beating really fast and that can be fun and feel really good when you're exercising because it's part of that exercise. Because of the connective tissue disorder, my um, heart rate works a little differently. <laughs> Sometimes I'll just be sitting on the couch like I am right now and all of a sudden, my chest will feel like I've just been running around a track or doing a lot of jumping checks. And my heart rate just goes really, really high. Um, Basil can smell that, and she will come over and alert me to it, usually by putting her paw on me, or if I'm standing up, she will actually stand straight up. She kind of looks like a kangaroo, just to get my attention, because I'm bad at noticing when she does small gestures. So she'll stand straight up to really get my attention because it's important. And she will insist that I either sit or lay down. So she won't leave me alone until I sit or lay down. And then that's the medical alert part, that she's alerting me to my high heart rate. The second part is her medical response task. And that will be to lay across my lap and um, apply her body weight to my legs. And that actually lowers the heart rate and helps me feel better. So if she doesn't do that, I might not notice my heart rate's going really, really high. And I could even actually pout, which can be a bit dangerous when I'm out and about if I'm on my own. So it's really helpful for her to tell me, hey, your heart rate's getting too high, and to make sure I sit or lay down. And she does the deep pressure therapy where she lays on me to bring my heart rate down. It helps me feel a lot better, and I recover a lot faster from those episodes when she's able to do that for me than before when I did not have a service dog. Basil does so, so, so much. Um, I yeah. want to, some of, some of what's going on here too is that Basil helps you do your work, right? And so you're a paleontologist. Um, we all know a lot of paleontologists uh, study dinosaurs. Uh, that's what Jay does. There's a lot of work that happens in the field. There's lots of work that happens in labs and at desks too. Um, but this whole journey uh, made you really have to reflect on a lot of the work that you did, right? I was wondering if you could walk us through that a little bit. Sure, yeah. I didn't know how sick I really was until fairly recently. So my health declined kind of recently in the last couple of years. And I actually had to take some time off from my PhD at the ROM. So I was on medical leave for over a year. And during that time is when I ended up getting basal. And at first, when I was getting diagnoses, diagnoses and learning about all the things that have been going on with my body that now made sense um, and had a medical explanation, I actually got um, pretty sad and pretty scared that I may not be able to come back and be a paleontologist and finish my PhD and do this job that I love because I didn't know very many or really any disabled paleontologists um, that I got to see very often. I was just, it's not something I had seen much at all in paleontology. So it was really scary for a little while. Um, and a big part of me being able to come back was actually Basil. So her alert, um, telling me my heart rate's too high, picking things up off the floor so I don't have to bend down, which can make my heart rate go too high, all that stuff allows me to be more independent, and that allows me to come back and be in the lab setting. Um, because if I didn't have her, there's a possibility I might pass out or something else might happen and it would be a lot harder for me to be in that setting. But having Basil really gives me a sense of security that I feel like even if my illnesses act up, she can help me with it. I can be more independent. I can come and do this work. 
And as I started to come back and talk more about being a paleontologist with disabilities and with a service dog, I actually found a community of disabled people who are scientists. So disabled scientists and disabled graduate students, mostly online because there's not a lot of us at any one institution. Um, but I found that community and it really helped. So when I didn't know if I could do that as a disabled person, I just didn't see myself in that role. It was really hard and really scary. But the more I've talked about it, the more I find there's a lot of people like me and they can do it. We can do it. So seeing disabled people in science has been really, really helpful. And I have been working to also try to highlight the role of service dogs in science and to try to get more museums and more universities on board with allowing service dogs into classrooms and into lab settings and things like that. Because if you don't see disabled people working where you are or in your classroom or wherever it is that you're going, if you don't see a disabled person there, it's not because they can't do that activity. It's usually because for some reason, they're not able to even get to that thing or that event to be able to be in that space. So that's why for me, accessibility is such an important topic to talk about because if you can't see yourself in a position, it's hard to then make it happen. It's hard to go and be there. And if all that's preventing disabled people from being in places like science labs and STEM um, organizations in general is a lack of representation, that just means those spaces are not accessible enough. So we need to do some work to make it more accessible for us to be there. Representation is so powerful for so many. Being able to see yourself makes you feel like you can do something. When I was growing up uh, for myself, uh, I really was fascinated by education, but I didn't have a teacher that looked like me until grade eight. And so, you know, I like to think about how Mr. Bahari and Rohana, uh, two of my teachers in grade eight, really helped me feel like I can be an educator. And so that's the same with so many different things, is when you feel like you're seen, it allows you to feel like I can do that too. You know, I can do these great things. Um, and one of the really powerful things that you mentioned to me, Jade, was that, you know, in the process of you um, not seeing other scientists like you, not other disabled scientists, um, you thought a lot about, you know what, this is an opportunity for me to be the person that people can see. Yeah, I, that's become really important to me. It's kind of one of the reasons I've found enough strength to come back and do this was Basil by my side and knowing that us being visible might at some point make it easier for other disabled people to jump into science and say, I know I can be there. Look at these people, they're doing it. And I'm so glad I found other disabled scientists who are doing similar work so we can work together. That's the most amazing part. <laughs> um, I want to, uh, we're, we're covering so much, we're covering so, so much. And so I think the dinosaur portion, we're not gonna have a lot of time for, but yeah. I wanted, if you could sort of walk us through some of the things uh, that Basil maybe has to wear um, or things like that um, to make uh, yeah. it easier for you to be able to do your work in your institution. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, for a service dog to be in laboratory spaces, it's really important that we train them to wear the same kind of gear that we would wear to be in that space to keep them safe. So that's an important part of uh, figuring out access to these spaces is what do we need the dogs to learn to wear and um, how can we make the lab safe for them and make them safe in the lab. So for that reason, Basil wears a full lab coat just like I do, you can see in those pictures. She wears boots on her feet and those are her lab boots in the picture. So those are the ones she wears inside the lab, protects her feet from any chemicals that might be around or anything else that might end up on the floor. And she also has boots she wears outside to protect her from salt and ice and broken glass or anything that might be on the sidewalk. Um, and in the lab, she also is trained to wear goggles, just like you might put on a pair of safety goggles if you're doing a science experiment. Basil has her safety goggles too. She even has earmuffs that she can wear. I'm not sure if I have pictures of those or not, but we have a rock saw because I cut up fossils for my research. 
So for her to be in the room with a rock saw, she has to have earmuffs on, just like I need to wear earmuffs if I'm going to use one of the bigger rock saws. So yeah, she's trained to use lots of different gear to keep her safe so she can be right there with me. That's awesome. Basil is super, super cool. Um, Basil helps you do all of these, uh, helps you do your science and sort of get around. I was wondering, um, Jade, what else maybe do you, what other tools do you use to make life more accessible? I use lots of different small mobility aids. A lot of people don't always notice them, but um, you've probably seen the rings that I'm wearing. Those are actually splints, so they help to keep my finger joints in place. So my joints are really loose from the connective tissue disorder. So these keep my joints more in place and it makes it a lot easier for me to type and pick up things without hurting my finger joints. So that's one really great thing. And then because some of the paleontology work that I do requires a lot of walking around and hiking, especially field work, I also have different types of braces that I wear on my legs to help me do that. So like this is one of my knee braces. They're pretty sturdy, big metal knee braces and they're hinged like that. So I wear those on my knees. I have one for both, uh, one for each. And that helps to keep the bones in my leg and my kneecap in place so that they don't do anything that I don't want them to do while I'm trying to hike around. Cause that's, that was one of the harder parts at first. Um, and then I have the same problem with my ankles. So <laughs> I have a lot of braces. I have a big collection. This is called an ankle foot orthosis and it goes on my calf and on my foot and it keeps my ankle joint from bending to the side so if you're looking straight at me it keeps my ankle from bending that way or that way it keeps me upright which is great because most of my injuries in the field were either before i uh, got braces were either my knees my hips or my ankles <laughs> so now i have braces for all of those and i also occasionally use a crutch um, or crutches, they are forearm crutches. So this is one of my crutches right here. And basically my arm goes in like that. And when I stand up, I don't have to put all the weight on my wrist. I can have my arm kind of straight out and that's really helpful. So I use those if I'm having a, a bad pain day or my joints are being particularly difficult. And once basil is fully grown, she will actually do some stuff that is mobility work. So a mobility service dog helps somebody move around. They could pull a wheelchair sometimes, or they might help you balance if you need to hold on to their harness while you're standing still to balance. Um, they can even kind of use a harness like this here. This will be Basil's when she's fully grown. And a strap like this, and that can help pull a person just a little bit so they don't have to use as much of their energy when they're walking, which is really, really helpful. <laughs> so many different tools and access to these tools is really important because being able to, whether it's Basil or these other tools that we're talking about, I'll get us into these spaces to do the things that we want to do. Um, and that's so important. Um, I want to very quickly talk about dinosaurs and specifically okay. um, the work that you do. What, do we, how, what is your study of dinosaurs? So I study how a certain group of theropod dinosaurs grow. So theropod dinosaurs are what we typically think are like the meat-eating dinosaurs that run around on two legs, like Tyrannosaurus rex is a really popular example. Um, I study dinosaurs called oviraptors. They also lived in the Cretaceous, and a lot of them did live alongside things like Tyrannosaurus rex um, or even T. rex. Uh, and they are really interesting. They're feathered, they have beaks, and they don't have any teeth. They have a crest on their head sometimes, some species don't. And we think they have these big, elaborate tail displays in some species. So they're a lot like a bird, um, but pretty big and definitely still a theropod dinosaur. So I look at their bones and I actually take slices, slices of them. I cut them up and look at them under the microscope. And I look for what we call uh, lags 
or like there's these rings. They're kind of like the rings in a tree. Um, and you can use those to see how old the animal was when it died before it got fossilized. And you can see how fast it was growing at different points in its lifetime. So that's, that's what I study. That's fascinating. Jade, we've covered so much today. We've learned a lot about basil. We learned a lot about tools and accessibility and how having those things allow us to like pursue the things that we want to pursue. Um, to everyone at home, let's sort of wrap this all up here by talking about our art project, okay? So I, if you can remember at the start, I used my invisible, I used my, my crayon, my white crayon on my paper to draw a picture, but you can't really see it. You can't see white crayon on a picture. And so what I did is I then used my paint to then paint right over. And then look how it like appears, right? Like, look at that. That's really important to our theme today. And so I drew a little theropod, kind of looks like a T-Rex, not an Odoraptor like what Jade studies. Uh, but you can see like, look at those teeth, look at those eyes, look at how it sort of just appears. And so this is what I sort of want to wrap up with. Often when we don't see ourselves in places, whether it's in a workplace or a show or something you want to do in life, it can make you feel like maybe there's no place for you there. That you're not allowed to do that work or play that sport, do that thing, be the person that you want to be. When you see someone like you though, uh, it can encourage you, it can empower you, help you believe that you too can be that scientist or musician or chef or doctor and so forth. It does take work to make representation happen though. And that's through creating inclusive solutions so that everyone can have access to take part in these dreams in the first place. These solutions can look like ramps, they can look like uh, braille or braces or service dogs or online meetings or school, uh, inclusive learning strategies, removing systemic barriers, or it can mean simply making sure sidewalks are clear of snow in the winter so folks with mobility devices can get around and so on and so on and so on. But all of this means that we need to fund these types of solutions too, okay? And creating rules to enforce that these solutions take place and to make places accessible for all. Uh, empathy, the act of putting uh, yourself in someone else's shoe is really important. Um, it allows you to imagine what it's like to be someone else. But after we're done imagining, we need to do the work to help support folks, okay? Empathy um, is important but we have to do work after that so that everyone can have this access and these abilities. And so that's where our, our project comes in. It's kind of like a metaphor. Uh, in this case, the invisible art is when people don't feel seen or represented or have access to a space. You can feel invisible, all right? And that doesn't feel good. When we paint over top though, like we did, um, that's when our art appears. That's what happens when we build supports, remove barriers, and make places accessible. This creates a world where we can have uh, diverse spaces in all places. And that's the show. Jade, thanks for coming on. Everyone, thanks for hanging out with us today as we talked about some very, very important uh, subjects. Remember, this will be up on YouTube later, so you can watch it there. You can find um, Jade Simon on Twitter, where she does a lot of wonderful outreach work at O is for Overraptor. Uh, so much to learn. And what's Basil's Twitter account again? Basil is Service Pup Basil. Yeah. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much. We had so much fun uh, with everyone today. Thank you at school, whether it's virtual or in class. Thank you to everyone in their kitchen. Uh, we'll see you next week when Kim Tate is on. That's it, everyone. Have a great day. Stay safe. Wear a mask. We love you. Bye, friends.